look at the sizes of their heads. For comparison, I'm going to reduce the size of the two noble Henrys. So that the eyes are level with the original engraving and the ends of the noses and the mouths. But the picture is this big. It's not appropriate to the size of the overall engraving. We've seen this particular device used before, haven't we? That would be an appropriate size for the head of the official engraving of William Shakespeare. But it's like that. It's cartoonish. Look at the other side. Here's Henry, 18th Earl of Oxford, reduced to the proper size. Eyes level, nose level, mouth level. That's the size they should be. And if you look at it like that, you can see, oh yeah, that looks <laughs> more normal. But we're so used to seeing it this way, we don't really notice. It's just like the Shakespeare engraving. You get used to it. But it's actually deliberately off. Alerting us to look more deeply at the hidden message. So this picture features a town here called Presbirch. The Danubius flu, that's the Danube River. And the publisher listed here, Claus Jans Vischer. On the Two Noble Henry's version, we have an unknown artist or publisher, circa 1624. In place of Vischer, it says, are to be sold by Thomas Jenner. The Danube River is no longer named, and Presbirch has been replaced with, can it be? Does it say De Vere? Not quite. It says De Vere, but if we cut off the top, it would say Vere, and cut off that R, it would have De Vere. That's not what it says. It says Der Vier, which means in German, the, and in Latin, truth. The truth. But it's not really a V, is it? You cut off the right part of it, it looks more like a T. Der Ter, which is an anagram of the tree. Does it mean the family tree? Look at the spur on the hoof of the foot of the rider that is directly connected to the end of that name. A spur. Shakespeare uses spur to mean the main root of a tree. Have I by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar, the tempest? Grief and patience rooted in him both mingle their spurs together. This literally in Cymbeline is talking about family. Mingle the spurs, the roots of the family tree. So he uses that word spur, and here it is in pictorial form, connected to an anagram that says possibly the tree. But twisted around, another portion of it looks like an H. De hair. And when you put those letters together, heredit is the ablative case of the Latin noun heres, meaning heir. The word ablative itself derives from the Latin ablatus, meaning taken away or stolen, and the ablative case is therefore used to express motion away from something, a stolen heir taken away. You've got a lot packed into this symbol, which is really a combination of a T and an H and a V, and that almost suggests there are three. And if the three is talking about a family tree of spurs, then it's Henry Rosely, 3rd Earl of Southampton, Henry de Vere, 18th Earl of Oxford, and the original Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, all connected through the family tree. So it's a very interesting conflation of three letters. TH, the triple tau, connected to V for Vere. I want you to look at this that the spur is attached to. In the Two Noble Henry's version, you know, it looks like it's just a church. We fade back to the Pres Birch version. That's a church, right? Fade back again to the Der Vier version, do you see letters there? Back to the church, you see, just a church. But in the new version, there are three letters. Only a master engraver could do such a thing. H-I-S. Not there in the old version, just a plain old church. 
but here it is. H I S. His. That little area is about half a centimeter. His family tree. The truth, the tree, the three, the spur, the main root of a tree, the air taken away, his family tree. But of course, the subterfuge goes far, far deeper. HIS is a, a reforming of the IHS in hoc senior Christogram of Roman Catholicism. No other symbol states Roman Catholic Church more definitively than this Christogram, and yet the characters in both these engravings are, first of all, both Protestant kings whose reigns were forbidden or curtailed to just over a year each, and the events depicted started as religious conflicts that became the Thirty Years' War, and it had disastrous political consequences for King James of England, not least because his own daughter Elizabeth was married to King Frederick V on the left and was thereby embroiled in the same embarrassment of being Queen of Bohemia for nearly a year. Not to mention the two noble Henrys depicted in this version, who both lost their lives fighting on the side of the Reformed Church. So whoever turned the symbol from IHS into HIS is making a very deep political and religious statement, as well as indicating his heir, his story, the De Vere story. This will become even more significant when we look into who created this engraving, who was the publisher, or maybe even the artist. Look at this emblem here on the horse in front of the picture. It's known as the Globus Cruciger, the orb and cross. It literally is the symbol for royalty. It means nothing but royalty. And yet, if you're going to copy this engraving, I mean, imagine the work involved. A new engraving that refers originally to a true king who was forced to abdicate after only a year. I mean, he was a true king, but to leave this on the horse of Henry the Eighteenth Earl of Oxford, Henry's not a king, is he? I mean, this is openly inviting accusations of treason, challenging the sovereignty of the current king of England, James. Why leave that on? I mean, to do an entirely new version and leave that on, that's a statement. Yes, it was perfectly true on the original engraving concerning Frederick V, but not about Henry the Eighteenth Earl. Look at this curious plumage on the rear of one horse and the mane of the other. It's known today as the Prince of Wales Ostrich Feathers, but this royal symbol was first associated with Blind King John of Bohemia, which is clearly why it's featured in the plumage on both these king's horses. Here he is depicted holding the Globus Cruciger and a scepter with a spray of ostrich feathers in his left hand. Legend has it that John was so brave he insisted on riding into battle in 1346 at the Battle of Creasy against the English. In this artist's impression, you see the spray of ostrich feathers in his helmet. He was defeated by Edward the Black Prince, eldest son and heir apparent of Edward III of England. He is said to have gone to the body of the dead king who he defeated and taken his helmet with its ostrich feather crest and as a sign of respect incorporated the feathers into his own royal arms along with King John's motto, Ich dien, I serve. The ostrich feather symbol is so important to the heritage of Bohemia, it is still honoured in modern day ceremonies. The symbol has been used by almost all royals since Edward adopted it, notably John of Gaunt, Henry IV, Henry V, Edward VI, even Queen Elizabeth I. Only from the beginning of the 17th century did the badge become exclusively associated with the Prince of Wales. And here's where the plot thickens, because it's only with that insignia where we start to see emblems of esoterica. This triple tau on the badge. It's on the unicorn. It's on the lion. It's on the upper lion as well. 
we see these symbols of hermeticism beginning to be incorporated into British royalty, yet they're, they're derived from Bohemian royalty, which in turn comes from the esoteric symbolism of the Rosicrucian movement and, of course, other Reformation movements that were happening at the same time. But aye, there's the rub, because these insignias were adopted by Henry, Prince of Wales, and Charles, Prince of Wales, the sons of King James. Yet clear as day, here are the two noble Henrys, stating categorically they are two royal Henrys, directly challenging the legitimacy of the monarchy, James, his deceased son, Henry, and the new heir-in-waiting, Charles. This is treason, writ large, loud and clear, and it doesn't end here. Look at this. It's the left hand of the man seated, Frederick or Henry VIII, Earl. It's a steel gauntlet. If I fade it slightly and show you, you can see the nails of the fingers underneath the gauntlet. But look at the letters that it implies. I mean, just say it. I am. I am. The right to be king, divine right of kings, a divine fiat. I am that I am. Again, if you're going to make a copy, you didn't need to keep that in. This is a political statement. It's true of this man, it's not true of this man, and yet it's been left in. Look at this. The right hand of the other man, Gabriel Bethlehem or Henry Rosley. This is the sleeve, this is the right thumb, the palm, and two fingers crossed. If you try to do this, it's really difficult with your right hand extended in that position. Crossed fingers has two meanings. It meant imploring God's help, or same thing it means today, a lie. <laughs> it's saying what's depicted here is a lie. Yet again, if you're going to make a copy, that would be true of this man who's saying, my kingdom was a lie. I, I was not allowed to rule. It was taken away from me. But if you're going to make a copy, why duplicate that part and have Henry Rosley saying the same thing? I'm an unacknowledged king. What you see here is a lie. Look at how he's seated on his horse. You can't be sitting side saddle on a horse rearing like that. It's just not possible. What it's saying is he's, he's not mounted on his horse. He's actually hovering somewhere between the, the darker horse and the lighter royal horse. It's a metaphor. He's not being allowed to actually sit on his throne, just as it was for Gabriel Bethlehem. Same thing in the original. So all of these clues have been left in plain sight for someone to see. The big question is why? But perhaps an even bigger question is... Who would even dare?